Even friends, when I first told them I was a nephrologist, they would start asking me questions about the brain and I'd tell them that, no, I'm, I'm a kidney doctor. And then when I tell people that I'm a transplant doctor, they ask you know, how my surgeries go. You know, no, I'm not a transplant surgeon. I, I look after transplant patients. My name is Andrew Malone. I'm an assistant professor of medicine at Washington University at St. Louis. And nephrology is really fascinating. It overlaps in many different areas of medicine. Many of our kidney patients have very complex and multiple medical problems. Many of them were very positive about it. And that was kind of inspiring and I continue to, you know, really enjoy working with kidney patients and glad I made the choice to go into nephrology. We're in a really exciting kind of era for anybody involved in kidney health or kidney disease. There's lots of movement towards improving access to transplantation. The priority that speaks to me most is transform, transplant, and increase access to donor kidneys. There is a lot of momentum already started in certain areas uh, of transplantation. You know, it, it can be a, a bit of a process. I was recently talking with a patient I was looking after who'd been on dialysis for six years. You know, I asked them, what took you so long and why did you wait six years uh, before you came looking for a kidney? They said, you know, I, I, I was under the impression that a, a kidney transplant wasn't available to me or wasn't an option for me. And it turned out that a number of people had told them that, you know, for whatever reason, maybe medical, that they wouldn't be suitable. But luckily, uh, they eventually came forward and they're now successfully transplanted. This highlights the point of the importance of awareness, not just to the public, but also to kidney patients and, and to our other healthcare provider colleagues. It's usually an option and certainly something that every patient with kidney failure should at least consider. And then the other area is, is trying to improve the number of donor kidneys available. Donor families are going through a very difficult and emotional period at the time when you might have to approach them about the question of donation. So if the word is out there and it's understood and, and known about the importance of, of donating and potential life you can give to a recipient, I think it would make that discussion a lot easier. But it's a really an exciting time for nephrology and I think it's, it's a good idea to get the word out there to our nephrology colleagues and the healthcare community in general and, and to the public. I'm Dr. Malone and I'm for Kidney Health. Hello, kidney community. My name is Selena Gomez, and I'm so excited to participate in my first ASN Kidney Week, even virtually. In 2017, I shared with my fans and followers that I got a kidney transplant due to complications from my lupus and encouraged them to do their part to increase awareness about lupus and kidney disease. I know that it was probably one of the scariest moments of my life personally to go through this process. I also had complications with mine and had to do surgery twice. I strongly support the American Society of Nephrology Vision of a world without kidney diseases. A big thank you to all of you and the ASN for driving breakthroughs and innovation in kidney medicine. On the 30th of June of this year, the kidney community lost one of its very best. On June 30th, we lost our beloved colleague and friend, Dr. Barbara Murphy. Dr. Murphy was a dynamo, a bright light in our field and a fearless leader who transformed kidney care through her tireless advocacy, her innovative research and many leadership roles. While Dr. Murphy's life was tragically cut short, she accomplished more than most can in many lifetimes. And she did so with a charm and wit that could match anyone in the room and then so. For those of you who might not be as familiar with Dr. Murphy's achievements, I will highlight a few. Born in Dublin, she was inspired to pursue a career in transplant medicine by a young dialysis patient who received a second chance at life after a successful kidney transplant. So upon completion of her medical training in Ireland, she hopped over the pond to Harvard to complete her training uh, in the Department of Immunogenetics. 
In 1997, Dr. Murphy was recruited to the Icon School of Medicine, Mount Sinai Hospital in New York as the Director of Transplant. And just six years later, she became the Division Chief of Nephrology, one of the youngest in the country. In 2012, she was appointed as the Chair of the Department of Medicine and in 2013, the Dean of Clinical Integration and Population Health for the entire Mount Sinai Health Network. Despite these large administrative roles, she remained an innovator and creative in research. She was one of the first to recognize that genetics and genomics were important in transplant medicine. She was the PI of a landmark multi-center study, the GOCAR study, focused on genomics of kidney transplant rejection, which was published in The Lancet. And her work helped launch two commercial entities focused on kidney health, Renalytics and Verici Diagnostics. But perhaps her greatest passion was in patient advocacy. She advocated unceasingly and successfully probably due to her unmatched ability to mobilize decision makers in government and community alike and bring them over to her side. When she first joined Mount Sinai, she successfully advocated so that HIV patients could receive transplants. And just last year in 2020, her advocacy was key in ending Medicare's three-year limit on immunosuppressive drug coverage for kidney transplant recipients, a huge win for our community. I had the personal privilege of meeting Barbara in 1997 at a kidney week, and we remained friends and colleagues ever since. Over the past six years, my fellow counselors and I have benefited tremendously from her sage counsel and her wicked wit, keeping our council meetings lively, but more importantly, keeping us on task and focused on what was most important. In the spring of 2020, when council meetings turned virtual, New York City became the epicenter of COVID-19 infection. As chair of a very large integrated clinical enterprise, Dr. Murphy commanded incredibly effective oversight of multiple hospitals, organizing delivery of care despite resource shortages, and most importantly, ensuring safety of patients, faculty, staff, and trainees, undoubtedly saving thousands of lives. Barbara's career was one of many firsts. She was the first female or male to be elected as president of two leading nephrology professional societies, the American Society of Transplantation, where she served as president from 2008 to 2009, and the American Society of Nephrology, the first time in history for these two organizations. The outpouring of grief and messages after her passing from around the world are but one demonstration of her broad reach. She was admired and loved by her family, by her husband Peter, her son Gavin, many other family members, and also by her faculty, colleagues, staff, and trainees for her enormous integrity, energy, generosity, and her kindness. She was a mentor to many, and she was a role model for all of us. This year, ASN launched a new Lifetime Achievement Trailblazer Award. In recognition of Dr. Murphy's transformational achievements, she was the inaugural recipient in May, and the award will bear her name in perpetuity. The Barbara T. Murphy Trailblazer Award recognizes individuals for their extraordinary contributions in any one or more of several domains, including patient care, research and education, as well as advocacy, creativity, entrepreneurship, leadership, or community service. These trailblazers will have elevated the profession by influencing disruptive and positive change. Their contributions are not limited to the traditional boundaries that define nephrology. With this award, ASN will honor and recognize leaders who embody the principles of the society and those of Barbara, and have the courage to forge new paths, overcome challenges, and serve as exemplars for future generations. I cannot imagine a better or more worthy recipient than Barbara. At this time, I'm also proud to announce that together with ASN, Verici Diagnostics Renalytics, two companies that Barbara was instrumental in launching, and the American Society of Transplantation, have established an endowed lecture to honor Dr. Murphy. The Barbara T. Murphy Endowed Lectureship will honor Dr. Murphy's legacy as a renowned leader in transplant immunology and medicine by recognizing advances in kidney transplantation. Starting next year, the Murphy Endowed Lectureship will take place annually at Kidney Week in perpetuity. 
At this time, I would like to thank Sarah Barrington, CEO of Verici Diagnostics, and James McCullough, CEO of Renalytics, as well as AST President, Dr. John Gill, for their partnership in establishing this endowed lecture to honor Dr. Murphy. As we look to the future, I hope each of us will channel Barbara's legacy in some way. The world is most definitely a better place because of Dr. Murphy, and her legacy will live on through her many, many talented mentees. In closing, I would like to share a post from one of these talented mentees. At the end of every lab meeting, Barbara would say, of course, in her beautiful Irish lilt, we have loads to do. In the words of Dr. Samira Farouk, cheers to you, Dr. Murphy, we'll get it done. And now it's up to each of us. Let's get it done. John Peters was clearly one of a kind. He was groundbreaking. He believes in progress, and he believed progress needed pushing. John Peters really is considered sort of the father of modern nephrology. He really was instrumental in uh, quantifying measurements of things like urine and blood. His laboratory was the bedside. He did his research at the bedside trying to understand patients. Dr. Peters really was a leader in using actual measurements in patients to uncover pathophysiology and to apply the advances in basic physiology to actually see how that could benefit patient care in the real world. Quantitative Clinical Chemistry was a groundbreaking book. It forced everybody to think in theorems and then test these theorems by uh, doing interesting experiments. He was sort of an early translational scientist. I think Peters was ahead of his time and I think he was a visionary. Peters wanted to speed up the evolutionary process of medical progress through medical science and education with federal funding. My grandfather had very strong values and felt it was very important that medical care be given to all Americans. It's interesting to think about current debate and recent healthcare legislation in light of what Peters promoted and pushed for back in the 1930s. Amidst all of his uh, medical excellence, he was committed to healthcare. It's this kind of breadth of concern for the health of the entire healthcare system uh, that made John Peters unique and established the legacy for the wonderful recipients we've had for the John Peters Award. ASN presents the 2021 Peters Award to Dr. Donald E. Wesson for outstanding contributions to nephrology and academic medicine and applying scientific and clinical expertise to improve the human condition. Currently professor of medicine at Texas A&M University College of Medicine, Dr. Wesson has achieved remarkable success translating bench to bedside, pioneering programs that bring research advances into the community inform clinical care and public policy, and improve health justice. His work centers on the kidney's role in maintaining acid base and electrolyte homeostasis, advancing understanding of distal tubular acidification, and connecting kidney acidifying mechanisms with dietary acid consumption and nephropathy progression. His lab began connecting the dots between dietary acid consumption, increased tissue acid content, and CKD progression. Seminal studies assessed acid retention, establishing urinary endothelin, aldosterone, and angiotensinogen concentrations as acidification biomarkers. Translational studies demonstrated an increase in the acid-producing content of the diet insufficient to decrease serum bicarbonate concentration, yet associated with an increase in acidity of the kidney interstitium. Human studies evidence significant acid retention ameliorated by oral sodium bicarbonate, dietary acid reduction with fruits and vegetables, and led to testing a new treatment for metabolic acidosis. Because CKD incubates for years before manifesting, 
The potential public health benefit of Dr. Wesson's work cannot be overstated. He helped launch a level three primary care clinic in a Dallas recreational center that led to substantial reductions in the use of emergency and inpatient care services and an innovative farm stand clinic adjunct. Dr. Wesson has advanced social justice within and outside academic medicine. Across numerous leadership roles, he insisted healthcare delivery systems fall short if they do not deliver health justice and has overseen systemic solutions to health disparities. As chair of the American Board of Internal Medicine and the ABIM Foundation, Dr. Wesson promoted professionalism and better approaches to ethical concerns, improved education and testing in the care of underserved and vulnerable populations, and help lead major public health initiatives, including Choosing Wisely. Dr. Wesson has mentored countless physicians and scientists, particularly those from underrepresented backgrounds. He is a human bridge advancing opportunities for early career professionals and challenging healthcare leaders to follow him. His focus on excellence, advancing research, and insistence that healthcare, research, and policy must promote health for all have advanced the human condition. ASN is honored to present the 2021 John P. Peters Award to Dr. Donald E. Wesson. Thank you, ASN leadership, including the members of the awards committee for this wonderful honor. It is particularly humbling to be recognized as exemplifying the characteristics of the career of John P. Peters, one whom I've always considered to be both a scientific and humanitarian giant of our profession. There are three aspects of his career that have been guiding lights of my own. First, he insisted that, quote, the proper study of mankind is man, unquote thereby arguing against the notion that research be limited to animals and experimental models. This focus helped lead our laboratory to exploring insights derived from our animal studies into patients whose interests we as physicians have sworn to uphold. Second, he insisted that the research program be woven into clinical quote, non-research settings, unquote. He forcefully advocated for weaving insights from basic studies into the clinical setting. I would extend this notion to argue that if we are to understand contributions to the genesis of chronic kidney disease, particularly as it applies to chronic kidney disease in vulnerable communities, that it must be studied in those communities. That perspective has fueled translation of our research from the basic science laboratory to the clinic and now to the community. Lastly, but most importantly, he insisted that we in the medical, including the research community, focus on social justice. His specific focus was on society providing healthcare and strategies to promote health for all of its residents. I encourage our entire community to share this focus, which has guided our laboratory as well. Thanks again, ASN, for this wonderful honor, and I look forward to continuing to serve the ideals exemplified by my hero, John P. Peters. Young investigators and kidney disease are definitely a hope for the future. The young investigator often has a new approach. Don Seldon was a master teacher and clinician. He had tremendous impact on young investigators. One of the major advantages to the whole community of the Young Investigator Award is to highlight new areas of science. We believe that funding young investigators is the key to keeping the next generation of scientists bringing new treatments for both kidney disease and heart disease. Dr. Seldon always encouraged young investigators to go after with dedication and diligence. 
give it everything you've got. He was a leader in academic nephrology, not only in research, but also in the practice of nephrology and education. The Department of Medicine at Southwestern took giant steps forward because of Dr. Selden. He helped many young investigators by directing them to the most logical set of experiments that would dig into the problem they were studying. He paid a lot of attention to young investigators because he realizes they are the future. Young investigators are actually making new discoveries that will help everyone, not only in nephrology, but in all fields of research. Research is at a really exciting time. We know more, we have more technology than we ever had before. So the potential to impact human disease is great. I think it's appropriate for Dr. Selden's name to be wedded to the Young Investigator Award. It bonds his name to those individuals who will carry science forward into a new era. The 2021 Donald W. Selden Young Investigator Award, co-sponsored by the American Society of Nephrology and the American Heart Association's Council on the Kidney and Cardiovascular Disease, is presented to Dr. Krzysztof Kiriluk for his wide-ranging studies on genetic factors that contribute to kidney disease. He is an Associate Professor of Medicine at Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons and a Physician Scientist in the Division of Nephrology at Columbia. Dr. Kiriluk received his medical degree at Columbia and completed his residency at Massachusetts General Hospital. He returned to Columbia for his Nephrology Fellowship at New York Presbyterian Hospital under the mentorship of Dr. Ali Garavi and joined the faculty in 2007. He has led major progress in the field of IgA nephropathy, kidney transplantation, and membranous nephropathy, and has authored over 130 papers on multiple research topics. Dr. Kiriluk's first major contribution focused on the genetics of IgA nephropathy. He and his collaborators demonstrated that geographic differences in the prevalence of this disease can be explained by variation in common genetic risk variants which led the field toward studies of mucosal immunity and host pathogen interactions. He extended this work to study the genetics of defective IgA glycosylation, a fundamental biochemical abnormality in IgA nephropathy, and identified two genes influencing this defect. The Kiriluk lab is investigating the genetics of kidney transplant rejection advancing understanding of basic transplant immunology and introducing a paradigm shift in clinical care through a novel risk stratification scheme. His team's work also provides a framework for identifying new histocompatibility loci for solid organ transplantation. Most recently, Dr. Kiriluk assembled a consortium to study the genetics of membranous nephropathy, opening new opportunities for clinical diagnosis and risk stratification, as well as highlighting pathways in disease pathogenesis and suggesting new therapeutic targets. He and his colleagues have developed a novel electronic algorithm to detect undiagnosed kidney disease by scanning health record data. Dr. Kiriluk has mentored a number of MD students and is now co-directing a TL1 training program. He lectures frequently at national and international meetings and chairs many scientific committees. The winner of multiple awards for his groundbreaking work, Dr. Kiriluk has provided numerous novel insights in genetics, data sciences, and nephrology. It's a great honor to accept the Donald Selden Award, and I would like to thank the Society for recognizing my work. The title of my talk is Genetic Discovery in IgA Nephropathy. This topic has actually been the focus of my work for many years, and I'm really happy to have this opportunity today to tell you about my journey into the genetic discovery for this disease. And these are my disclosures. Uh, none of them really relevant to this talk. 
IgA nephropathy is a common form of glomerular nephritis, and a kidney biopsy is required for the diagnosis. And classic findings on kidney biopsy include mesangial hypercellularity, which you see on the left, as well as demonstration of mesangial IgA deposits, uh, which can be seen on immunofluorescence uh, in the image on the right. It's interesting that IgA nephropathy onset and IgA nephropathy flares are associated with upper respiratory infections. From the genetic perspective, IgA nephropathy um, has been reported to have familial aggregation. And there are also these interesting geographic differences in the disease prevalence, with the disease actually being most common in East Asia. Uh, this is our working pathogenesis model for IgA nephropathy, also known as um, multi-hit pathogenesis model. Uh, the first hit in the model involves production of galactose-deficient IgA1. I'll tell you more about the um, galactose deficiency um, in IgA nephropathy in subsequent slides. The second hit in the model involves uh, production of antiglycan antibodies. Once both of these uh, hits are present in the circulation, uh, formation of immune complexes can occur, and immune complexes then get deposited in the kidney mesangium, leading to activation of mesangial cells and also activation of inflammatory processes that ultimately result in kidney damage. So from the perspective of a genetic study design, I consider this to be a highly complex model that involves an autoimmune component, circulating factors that promote formation of immune complexes, and um, subsequent kidney damage, uh, which is also a complex process and involves inflammatory cells uh, and their effect on uh, the glomerulus. So one could uh, take uh, several different approaches to study the genetic risk factors in IgA nephropathy, and we think uh, a lot about this model when designing our genetic studies. One could, for example, study more proximal um, factors in a pathogenesis model, and I'll discuss some of the genetic studies of IgA levels and also of IgA O-glycosylation. One could also try to uh, address the distal uh, uh, portion of the model, looking at the uh, biopsy diagnosed disease state. And the main limitation here is the sample size and availability of um, biopsy diagnosed cohorts uh, for genetic studies. And I briefly want to outline the nature of uh, glycosylation defects in IgA nephropathy. Immunoglobulin A has two subtypes in humans. IgA1 is the most common subtype, and the unique feature of IgA1 is its hind region. This hind region is rich in serine and threonine residues uh, that undergo sequential O-glycosylation. This O-glycosylation process involves addition of GALNAC, addition of galactose, and internal silination by silyl transferases. Uh, this is a normal configuration of carbohydrates on the hind region of IgA1 that's present uh, under normal conditions. And it turns out that this process is defective in IgA nephropathy. Uh, specifically, the final configuration in uh, patients with IgA nephropathy involves uh, uh, GALNAC uh, that is terminally silylated, um, but this, um, uh, 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 this uh, structure is deficient in galactose. And this particular configuration of carbohydrates represents a putative epitope in IgA nephropathy that is thought to be recognized by um, uh, antiglycan antibodies. Uh, so early on in my research career, when I joined the lab of Ali Garavi at Columbia, Ali demonstrated that um, galactose-deficient IgA1 levels in the circulation are highly heritable. And he demonstrated this by measuring serum gal-deficient IgA1 levels in patients with IgA nephropathy and in their blood relatives, as well as uh, ancestry-matched healthy controls. And as you can see from the graph here, patients with IgA nephropathy have elevated levels of galactose-deficient IgA1, but also their blood relatives, actually roughly one-third of their blood relatives, has, um, also have also uh, levels that are above 90th percentile for uh, healthy controls. And uh, these findings were there, then replicated by myself, um, uh, uh, looking at the inheritance of galactose-deficient IgA1 levels in families of patients with pediatric IgA nephropathy and also pediatric henoch schaumlein purpura nephritis, demonstrating a very similar pattern where the blood relatives have also elevated levels of this, um, uh, uh, of this biomarker. 
And these findings have been replicated in multiple studies estimating the heritability of galactose deficient IGA-1 in the range of 50 to uh, 80%. And this is just an example of an extended pedigree that I studied um, uh, nearly 15 years ago um, uh, with IgA nephropathy. In this particular pedigree, you can see four cases with biopsy-diagnosed IgA nephropathy. Those individuals are colored in red. And we have organized uh, family reunion meetings where we collected serum samples from these um, uh, uh, individuals and also from their blood relatives and um, um, we measured galactose deficient IJ1. And what you see in black are individuals with uh, galactose deficient IJ1 levels that are above 95th percentile for healthy controls. You can almost appreciate a, 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 an autosomal dominant inheritance pattern uh, with incomplete penetrance, perhaps. Uh, but a lot of in, uh, blood relatives actually have elevated galactose deficient IJ1 levels um, compared to marines into the family that served as uh, controls. And at the time, we were trying to address these, uh, this, uh, these findings by linkage analysis and then sequencing of candidate genes under the linkage peaks. But that approach has not really uh, been successful. And so over years, uh, the technology has evolved uh, to allow us to address uh, some of the genetic determinants of galactose deficient IgA1 in uh, other ways. So over the past 15 years, I have witnessed a rapid evolution of methods and technologies that are being used for genetic discovery. And this really has accelerated the field by improving the standards and the resolution of uh, specifically case control genetic association designs, uh, which turned out to be extremely powerful. So this picture just illustrates the basic uh, concept be behind the case control genetic association study design. A large number of cases and controls are being profiled for genetic variants. The frequency of genetic variants is being compared between cases and controls. And then associated variants are uh, being mapped to genes, um, to cell types, to specific pathways, and uh, to the disease process. So all of the steps along this pathway have been evolving really rapidly, uh, including the technology for variant detection, which I think has been a predominant driver behind the, uh, this progress. Uh, this uh, uh, started with SNP arrays, which were profiling roughly 500,000 to 2 million SNPs uh, on a single chip, uh, followed by introduction of exome sequencing with sequencing of all of the coding regions of the genome, and now genome sequencing also being routinely available uh, for uh, research, uh, genetic research studies. Variant disease association methods uh, uh, have also evolved uh, rapidly. Uh, the standards for genome-wide association studies have been established. Uh, also, similar standards for sequence-based collapsing tests have been established. More recently, people developed methods for phenome-wide association studies that utilize biobanks li linked to electronic health records. And then uh, the whole field of, uh, uh, of mapping variants to genes to function has also evolved rapidly. Uh, with improved coding variant annotations and tissue uh, types uh, specific regulatory and AQTL maps uh, that are now available publicly uh, and more recently with the addition of single cell sequencing that now allows for mapping of variants to function in a cell type specific fashion. So major progress uh, here and I'll discuss some of the application of these methods to uh, IgA nephropathy. Uh, for example, we were able to apply the uh, GWAS approach, uh, genome-wide association study approach, to study the genetics of serum gal deficient IJ1 levels. In this uh, study, we had um, measured uh, serum galactose deficient IJ1 levels in uh, well over 2,000 individuals, and we analyzed um, the levels in relationship to the genotypes um, in individuals typed with genome-wide arrays. And what you can see in the Manhattan plot is that we picked up two genome-wide significant uh, loci, uh, one encoding C1-GALT1, a key enzyme. This is the key enzyme that adds galactose to the hint region of IgA1, as well as C1-GALT1-C1, which is its molecular partner, a chaperone molecule that is uh, responsible for uh, proper functioning of galactose transferase. Uh, so these uh, uh, two loci explained roughly five to seven percent of the variance in galactose deficient IJ1 levels 
and uh, we were very pleased to see that these loss are then replicated in subsequent uh, GWAS studies from other groups. Similar to galactose deficient IgA1, we were interested in uh, applying GWAS approach to serum IgA levels. Serum IgA levels are elevated in approximately 50% of patients with IgA nephropathy, so they uh, seem to be relevant to the phenotype, and we felt that by uh, discovering genetic factors that control IgA levels, we might accelerate the discovery of um, risk factors for IgA nephropathy. IgA, of course, plays a role in mucosal immunity and autoimmune inflammatory disorders, um, and uh, it's known that serum IgA levels increase with older age, also in obesity and diabetes and hypertension. It's been estimated that the heritability of uh, serum IgA level, uh, levels is uh, roughly 20 to 60%. Uh, so Lily Liu, who is a postdoc in my lab, uh, undertook an effort to uh, perform a GWAS for uh, serum IgA levels. She has actually meta-analyzed data from 17 international cohorts, um, totaling in over 40,000 individuals. And I have to say that some of these cohorts, we, uh, for some of the cohorts, we actually measured um, total IgA levels in our lab, which was quite a, a big task considering these large numbers. But this um, actually turned out to be extremely fruitful in terms of genetic discovery. We have um, discovered 20 genome-wide significant loci um, explaining roughly 2% of variance in the circulating IgA levels. And we estimated the SNP-based heritability of this trait at roughly 7%. Importantly, we already see some overlap in susceptibility between uh, these loci and uh, studies of uh, IgA nephropathy, which I'll uh, um, describe in more detail in subsequent slides. When we intersect um, candidate genes from GWAS loci with mouse phenome databases, uh, we observe significant overlap with genes that produce abnormal IgA levels and abnormal responses to infection when genetically manipulated in mice. We next examined genome-wide genetic correlations between IgA levels and other complex traits that have been previously studied by GWAS, including autoimmune, infectious, and cardiometabolic traits. The most significant positive correlation that we observed was for IgA nephropathy. Um, we also observed positive correlation with IgA deficiency and rheumatoid arthritis, and negative correlations with celiac disease and inflammatory bowel disease. In the infectious categories, uh, where we obtained GWAS summer statistics from 23andMe uh, for the largest GWASs of across various common infections, we observed positive genetic correlation with tonsillectomy and also strep throat, and negative correlation with several other infections that did not include upper respiratory uh, manifestations. In the cardiometabolic um, uh, category, we observed positive correlation with BMI and type 2 diabetes, which was really uh, surprising but consistent with uh, the epidemiologic data um, that demonstrates um, that uh, IgA levels are elevated in uh, individuals who are obese and who have type 2 diabetes. Most of these associations were then replicated in a meta-phenome-wide association studies of uh, genome-wide polygenic score for IgA levels that we developed based on GWAS summary statistics, and we tested that score against combined electronic health record data across UK Biobank and Electronic Medical Records and Genomic Consortium, uh, including a total of uh, nearly 600,000 individuals. What you can see in the STIWAS plot is that the polygenic determination of IgA levels has many uh, phenotypic correlates and phenotypic manifestations. And uh, interestingly, we uh, uh, found a positive uh, association with increased risk of hematuria, of course, the key manifestation of IgA nephropathy. We also looked at 20 genome-wide significant loci for IgA levels in summary statistics for the largest intestinal microbiome, GWAS, that involved uh, nearly 1,800 uh, Europeans. Uh, we observed an excess of um, pos positive associations as visualized, visualized by this QQ plot for these 20 significant SNPs uh, in association with microbiome diversity. Uh, 
There was, in fact, a negative genome-wide genetic correlation with microbiome diversity, suggesting that higher IgA levels are genetically correlated with lower diversity. We repeated these analyses uh, for each individual species uh, that was included in the microbiome profiling, and we found that the largest deviation uh, was for the abundance of Doria longicatena, a species that has previously been associated with BMI and insulin resistance. So these findings, although uh, still correlational and very preliminary, uh, suggest that perhaps intestinal microbiome represents an important mediator of the effect of IgA levels on uh, the features of metabolic syndrome. What about genetic studies of biopsy-proven IgA nephropathy? I wanted to present this in a bit of a historical context. Uh, the first uh, time GWAS methods were used was in 2005, and it wasn't until 2010 that the first GWAS uh, discovery study for IgA nephropathy was performed. This was a relatively small study documenting a strong contribution of the HLA region to the disease risk. In 2011, we followed with our first GWAS, demonstrating two additional loci on chromosome 1 and coding complement factor H, and on chromosome 22. This was followed by another uh, study performed in Han Chinese cohorts, uh, demonstrating two additional genome-wide significant loci, um, encoding defense in alpha genes and TNFSF13. And this was um, then followed by our much larger GWAS study that I'm going to discuss in a little bit more detail uh, in subsequent slides, uh, discovering 15 independent genome-wide significant risk alleles. Um, additional uh, studies in Han Chinese, bringing the uh, total number of genome-wide significant loci uh, to over 20, and a couple of fine mapping studies uh, demonstrating clear contribution of the uh, deletion of complement factor HR13 genes um, as uh, protective against IgA nephropathy, and also uh, another study demonstrating low copy number of defense and alpha genes um, as representing risk factors for IgA nephropathy. Despite all of this progress, there's still a lot of work that uh, needs to be done uh, in um, understanding the genetic architecture of this disease. Mainly, we still, we still need larger genome-wide meta-analyses uh, because it really seems like each time a sample size is uh, being increased in these studies, additional loci are being discovered and new insights are being gained into the disease pathogenesis. Um, we also need studies in more diverse populations. Present studies are really limited to individuals of uh, European ancestry and um, uh, East Asian ancestry. And finally, we need rare variant association studies as well, because the contribution of rare variants uh, to the disease risk is presently unknown, uh, and uh, sequencing of some of these GWAS cohorts is presently ongoing. Uh, this was our last published um, GWAS in uh, 2014, demonstrating uh, 15 independent risk alleles uh, that were genome-wide significant on condition analyses. Uh, and you can appreciate that there are a lot of non-HLA uh, signals on the Manhattan plot. When we did a pathway analysis, we saw a massive enrichment in the pathway called intestinal network for IgA production. Uh, further emphasizing that um, regulation of IgA production uh, is an impo important component of the uh, pathogenesis of this disease. Uh, based on our GWAS findings, we also performed a number of um, fun analyses, such as the one depicted here, where we looked at the distribution of risk alleles for IgA nephropathy across global populations, and we demonstrated strong eastward gradient of genetic risk placing East Asian populations at the highest uh, inherited risk of the disease. This pattern was consistent with uh, what's known about the disease prevalence. Of course, um, IgA nephropathy is very common in East Asia. And we then also correlated uh, this genetic risk with um, many different ecological variables, including pathogen diversity. And we detected a very strong geospatial correlation uh, between inherited risk of IgA nephropathy and helminth, helminth diversity, meaning the diversity of different species, uh, helminthic species infecting humans. This led us to hypothesize that perhaps IgA nephropathy risk alleles are actually protective against these endemic pathogens such as, such as helminthic infections and maintained at high frequency in some geographic regions uh, by the virtue of polygenic adaptation. 
In the last few minutes of uh, my talk, I will uh, present um, the findings of our newest uh, genome-wide association study for IgA nephropathy, uh, recently completed, uh, that involved uh, over 10,000 of biopsy-diagnosed cases and 28,000 matched controls across 17 international cohorts, a study uh, performed um, in collaboration with Elena Sanchez-Rodriguez. In this uh, large-scale GWAS, uh, we discovered a total of 33 independent risk alleles, and now the percentage of risk variance explained by uh, these risk loci is up to uh, 11%. We also estimated the SNP-based heritability um, for IgA nephropathy to be roughly 23%. Uh, this picture depicts that um, most uh, GWAS loci for IgA nephropathy, non-HLA GWAS loci that were significant in, in this large study, uh, also have an effect on multiple other phenotypes uh, that have been previously studied by GWAS. This is data based on GWAS uh, catalog. And the shared effects are predominantly on autoimmune and inflammatory phenotypes, but also for traits related to cell counts and antibody levels. Uh, similar to the GWAS for IgA levels, we also performed genome-wide genetic correlations uh, for biopsy-diagnosed IgA nephropathy uh, to define other complex traits with shared genetic architecture. Because HLA has such large effect on a disease risk, we performed this analysis with and without HLA. And uh, in this analysis, we confirmed positive uh, genetic correlation between IgA nephropathy and IgA levels also defined positive correlation with allergy, rheumatoid arthritis, several infections, and a negative correlation with inflammatory bowel disease and related diseases. We were especially interested in exploring genetic intercorrelation between IgA levels, IgA nephropathy, and tonsillectomy. So we next examined individual genome-wide significant loss shared between these traits. As an example, I'm showing here the regional plots uh, for the chromosome 22 locus, which is one of the first non-HLA risk loci for IgA nephropathy described by our group. This locus is genome-wide significant with a concordant effect on all three phenotypes. Using a Bayesian colocalization analysis, we demonstrate that all three phenotypes are likely to share the same causal variance at this locus. In addition to this example, there are six uh, such co-localizing significant loci between IgA levels and IgA nephropathy, and three between IgA levels and tonsillectomy, all with concordant effects. So we next use the Mendelian randomization approach with IgA level increasing alleles as an instrument to demonstrate that elevated IgA levels are actually causally related to both IgA nephropathy and tonsillectomy. And I think these results nicely demonstrate how these type of multi-phenotype genetic analyses uh, can be used to test specific causal hypotheses. These findings, of course, have treatment implications since our genetic evidence really provides support to therapies that aim to lower circulating IgA levels. Uh, lastly, using a variety of approaches, we designed a functional scoring method to prioritize most likely causal genes at each of the genome-wide significant loci. Our scoring method considers uh, several different features, including proximity of the signal to the closest gene, enhancer promoter maps that are publicly available, blood and immune cell EQTL maps, as well as mouse knockout phenotypes, and several other uh, criteria. The figure here depicts the top prioritized genes over 25 non-HLA risk loci. For each candidate gene, we then ident identify existing drugs that target its gene product by searching um, industry databases of drugs uh, that are currently in development or in clinical trials. This figure summarizes 14 loci encoding existing drug targets among prioritized candidate genes. In the first column, you can see risk allele. Second column indicates candidate uh, target encoded by the locus, then related target, targeting drugs, and current indications. Importantly, I think this analysis identifies several specific ligand receptor pairs um, that have strong genetic support for therapeutic uh, targeting. And as an example, I would like to point out two independent genome-wide significant loss on chromosome 17, one encoding April, a powerful cytokine stimulating IgA production, and another one encoding TASI, an April receptor uh, that is expressed on B cells. It's really exciting to see that there are currently several uh, drugs and clinical trials that target this system in IgA nephropathy. 
more generally, I think there is good evidence that drugs aimed at targets that are supported by genetic evidence are more likely to succeed in clinical trials. And we hope that this type of analysis will facilitate drug repurposing uh, for IgA nephropathy. In summer, I think genetic studies are starting to redefine IgA nephropathy, and I hope I convinced you uh, that they also hold promise to provide better treatments for our patients. I have been very fortunate to start my research career right at the beginning of the genetic revolution. However, most of this work would not have been possible without the support of my mentor and long-term colleague, Ali Garavi. Ali is a great scientist. He's a natural leader and a good friend, and I'm truly honored to be one of his trainees. I also want to acknowledge Don Landry, Kai Salakari, John Barash, J. Radhikrishnan, Vivet Dagari, Simon Sanakirki, and other division members for being amazing colleagues. Some of you have been an inspiration since my medical school days at Columbia, uh, and I think you really continue to help me grow as a physician uh, scientist every day. I also want to acknowledge my lab members who do all of the hard work. Uh, you've seen pictures of some of them in my presentations, and they generated most of the results that I discussed today. I'm not able to name each of them individually, but I'm fortunate to be able to work with such an amazing team of talented and dedicated people. I think genetics is a team sport, and I've been lucky to benefit from a great team of collaborators over years. This includes scientists and clinicians from over 70 research centers and clinical sites across 25 countries. We actually love to get together and enjoy good food and drinks, as you can see in the pictures on the left. And I really regret that I can't see you in person this year. But I think um, uh, I, I really want to thank each of you for making um, our genetic studies possible. Lastly, I want to mention that a lot of the work that I discussed today is not published yet, but will hopefully be available in a preprint format uh, when you hear this presentation uh, during the ASN. Thank you again for listening, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Hello, my name is Deidre Cruz, and it's been my pleasure to serve as Kidney Week Education Committee Co-Chair alongside Dr. Anam Karamanchi. All of us have continued to face many challenges this year and have persevered. This year's Kidney Week could not have been possible without the expertise and flexibility of hundreds of faculty and volunteers. Thank you. Today's state-of-the-art lecture will be delivered by Dr. David Williams, on social inequities in health, how can we effectively reduce them? Dr. Williams is the Florence and Laura Norman Professor of Public Health and Chair of the Department of Social and Behavioral Sciences at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. He is also a Professor of African and African American Studies at Harvard. Dr. Williams has played a national leadership role in raising awareness of health inequities and identifying interventions to address them. His work has included serving as the staff director of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Commission to Build a Healthier America. This nonpartisan health commission is focused on identifying evidence-based non-medical strategies that can improve the health of all Americans and reduce racial and socioeconomic gaps in health. He was a scientific advisor to the award-winning PBS film series, Unnatural Causes is Inequality Making Us Sick. Dr. Williams has served on 10 committees of the National Academy of Sciences. His research has been featured in the national print and television media and in his TED Talk. An internationally recognized social scientist, Dr. Williams' research has advanced understanding of the complex ways in which socioeconomic status, stress, racism, health behavior, and religious involvement can affect health. The author of more than 500 scientific papers, he has served on the editorial boards of 12 scientific journals and as a reviewer for more than 75 others. He developed the Everyday Discrimination Scale, which is the most widely used measure of discrimination in health studies. Dr. Williams has received numerous honors and awards. He was elected to the National Academy of Medicine, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the National Academy of Sciences. He has also received Distinguished Contribution Awards from the American Sociological Association, the American Psychological Association, and the New York Academy of Medicine. Dr. Williams was ranked as one of the top 10 
most cited social scientist in the world by the Institute for Scientific Information Essential Science Indicators. In 2014, Thomson Reuters ranked him as one of the world's most influential scientific minds. Now, I'll turn it over to Dr. Williams. It is truly an honor and privilege to be speaking to you today. Uh, my presentation is entitled um, Social Inequities in Health and What We Can Do to Effectively Reduce Them. Um, there are large racial inequities in renal disease. Uh, compared to whites, African Americans have higher incidence of disease, elevated rates of progression from chronic kidney disease to ESRD, have a prevalence of ESRD that is four times greater, um, require dialysis at younger ages, and have greater incidence of ESRD at each decade of life. So quite a stunning pattern of racial uh, inequities. And racial inequities in health exist not just for kidney disease, but exist for a broad range of outcomes in the United States and are persistent over time. We get a look at this by looking at life expectancy by race from 1950 to 2020. We have data going back that far for only blacks and whites. You can see there was an eight-year gap in life expectancy um, back in 1950, and there's a six-year gap uh, in 2020. If you look at the life expectancy of whites in 1950, it was 69.1 years, life expectancy at birth. Uh, how long did it take for African Americans to reach the health that whites had in 1950? It was not until 1994, T years later, that African Americans had the health that whites had in 1950. And the COVID-19 pandemic has been actually making things dramatically worse. If you look at national data on life expectancy declines uh, from 2019 to 2020, we have seen historic declines that we have not seen uh, the, that of that magnitude uh, since the Second World War, with the declines being larger for men than for women and being larger uh, for Latinos and African Americans um, than in fact uh, for whites. What drives these large racial inequities in health? Well, there are large racial inequities uh, in socioeconomic status um, in, the, in the United States and elsewhere. Um, and then race and ethnic status in the US captures variation in socioeconomic status. I'm gonna illustrate this with national data for the United States on median household income uh, in 2018. And I'm presenting it in a way that's just easy to grasp the magnitude of the inequities. I've standardized the household income of whites as $1. And for every dollar of household income white households receive, Asian households receive $1.23. Asian households are heavily made up of immigrants who've come to the United States with high levels of education. Asian households are also more likely to be multi-generational than any of the other groups. But for every dollar of household income white households receive, Latino households receive 73 cents, and Native American and African American households receive 59 cents. What is stunning about the 59 cents figure for blacks is this gap in 2018 is identical to the racial gap in income in 1978. I said that correctly, 1978, the peak year of the narrowing of the black-white gap in income as a result of the anti-poverty policies and the civil rights policies of the 60s and, 20, and 70s, the gap was reduced uh, to 59 cents, and in 2018, it is still 59 cents. Most Americans think we have made more economic progress in the United States than that. And as bad as those data look, the income data, they understate the racial gap in economic status. Why? Because income merely captures the flow of resources into the household. It doesn't tell us anything about the economic reserves that households have to cushion shortfalls of income. We get that from data on wealth. And the Federal Reserve Board indicates that for every dollar of wealth that white households have, black households have 10 pennies and Latino households have 12 pennies. And what low economic status means is that even though we may be in the same storm of the pandemic, we are in different boats. And some boats are much better able to weather the storm than others. When my career started, most researchers thought 
that the racial ethnic differences in health were simply a function of racial ethnic differences in socioeconomic status, income, uh, education, wealth, and so on. We now know that life is more complicated than that, and I'm going to illustrate that for you with national data, life expectancy at age 25. At age 25, how long will the average uh, person live? Well, the average white person will live five years longer than the average black person at age um, 25. But if we look by education, whites with a college degree or more education live 6.4 years longer than whites who have not finished high school. Importantly, the gap by education, it's also true for income, um, is larger than the racial gap. And within African Americans, again, we see the same pattern, the gap between African Americans with the highest level of education and those with the lowest is 5.3 years. Again, bigger than the black-white gap. So should we only focus on socioeconomic status? No. Why? Because if we look at um, every level of education, there still is a racial gap. White high school dropouts live 3.1 years longer than black high school dropouts, and the gap widens as education increases with the best of African Americans, those with a college degree or more education, have lower life expectancy than whites with a college degree, than whites with some college education, than whites who have graduated from high school. What do these data tell us? They tell us that there's something profound about income and education that matter for your health regardless of your race. But they tell us there's something else about race that matters for your health even after we've taken income and education into account. And so researchers have been asking for the last quarter century, could racism be a critical missing piece of the puzzle to understand the patterning of racial inequities in health. And when I say racism, I think of it as a societal system that is shaped by and reshapes other larger systems in society. This system devalues and disempowers some groups, uh, differentially allocates opportunities and resources based on an ideology of inferiority. This leads to the development of negative attitudes and beliefs, prejudice and stereotypes. It leads to differential treatment, that is discrimination, by individuals and societal institutions. I want to talk about one mechanism of upstream structural or institutional uh, uh, racism. Um, in 2001, I published a paper where I argued that racial residential segregation was a fundamental cause of racial disparities in health, and we're kidding ourselves if we think we will solve the inequities problem if we don't understand the, the processes produced by segregation. Uh, John Sell, a historian at Duke University, wrote a book about the segregation, and he argued it was one of the most successful domestic policies of the 20th century in the United States. Why does segregation matter? Think of segregation as a burglar at midnight. When it slips into a community, valuables begin to disappear, like quality schools and safe playgrounds and good jobs and a, a healthy environment and safe housing and access to high quality transportation and high quality medical care. All of these resources are patterned by the neighborhood in which you live in these United States. Let's look at some empirical data. Williams, Julius Wilson and Robert Sampson, two eminent sociologists at Harvard University, studied the 171 largest cities in the United States and said there's not even one city where whites live under equal conditions to those of blacks because of segregation. And the worst urban context in which whites reside is considerably better than the average context of black communities. Now that's a 1995 publication. Have things gotten better over time? Let me draw on the work of Dolores Acevedo Garcia of Brandeis. She's created a neighborhood opportunity index, ranking every county in the United States on almost 30 different indicators of access to opportunity for children, like the quality of schools and the graduation rate and the household income level and the home ownership rate and the quality of the air, water, and soil, and access to resources for health like green space and healthy food outlets and safe places to walk. And what she finds is that if you look at the 100 largest metro areas in the United States, two-thirds, 67% of all African-American children 58% of all Latino kids and 53% of all Native American kids are residing in very low or low opportunity neighborhoods compared to one in five white and Asian kids. 
on the opposite end of the scale, almost two thirds of white and Asian kids live in high and very high opportunity neighborhoods compared to only one in five um, African American and Latino kids. What the research is actually telling us is that these inequities at the neighborhood level are in fact the driver, the creator of the racial differences in income and education that we see in the first place. I'm drawing here on the work of David Cutler um, and his colleague Glaser, uh, eminent economist at Harvard University, looking at national data for the United States using fancy econometric models, is able to statistically show if you could eliminate residential segregation in the United States, you would completely erase black-white differences in income, in education, in unemployment, and reduce black-white differences in single motherhood by two-thirds. All of these striking differences are driven by opportunity at the neighborhood level. One more Harvard economist, Raj Chetty, he has asked an intergenerational question. He started out looking at black and white children who start out in, the, uh, in life in homes with the same level of parental income. And he asked, how are the children doing in the next generation? And what he found is stunning. Black boys have lower income than white boys in 99% of census tracts in America, controlling for parental income. Why? They live in neighborhoods that differ in access to opportunity. When black and white boys live in neighborhoods that have the same level of opportunity, black boys do well. The problem is such neighborhoods are few and far between in the United States. What I'm saying to you today is the science is telling us that the racial inequities in income and education that matter for life and health do not reflect a broken system. No, they reflect a carefully crafted system functioning as plans, successfully implementing social policies, many of which are rooted in racism. These inequities are not accidents or acts of God or reflective behavior of individuals. They illustrate the extent to which racism has produced a truly rigged system in the United States. And this segregation also affects access to medical care. Let's look at South LA, a segregated community with high levels of pre-existing comorbidities and uncontrolled chronic diseases, uh, with fewer physicians than the average community um, in, in the United States. Um, there's a shortage of primary care doctors in segregated neighborhoods, a severe shortage of, of specialists, uh, three times more diabetes in this segregated community than in the rest of California and diabetic amputation is among the most frequent surgical procedures performed in the local hospital, with life expectancy being 10 years shorter in this community than the average for the state of California. And there are challenges uh, with funding uh, health care. Medicaid is the most common insurance, and the average ER visit in LA earns about $2,000 from commercial insurers, 650 uh, for dollars from Medicare, but only 150 uh, from Medicaid. And this lifelong reduced access and quality of care contributes to poorer management of disease and worse outcomes, not only in South LA, but in poor communities across the United States. What I'm saying is the historic and ongoing underfunding of care in segregated communities has created a separate and unequal health system in the United States. And segregation affects health in other ways. Research indicates that when you are low in economic status, living in a disadvantaged, segregated neighborhood, that leads to higher levels of exposure and greater clustering of economic stressors, of psychosocial stressors, of physical and chemical stressors. So we've talked about how segregation uh, has a negative impact on health, one mechanism of racism. Another mechanism is individual discrimination that is an added source of toxic stress. This is the everyday discrimination scale, a scale I developed um, some 25 years ago that is now the most widely used measure of discrimination in health studies across the world. Uh, there are over uh, 450 papers published uh, using the everyday discrimination scale uh, that finds negative effects on health. 
what does the scale capture? Not all the aspects of, of, of discrimination, but just the little indignities. Being treated with less courtesy and respect than others, receiving poorer service than others at restaurants or stores, people acting as if they think you are not smart, they are afraid of you, they think you are dishonest, they're better than you are. Just to illustrate the power of this scale, I'm showing you work from one researcher, Dr. Tenney Lewis. Each line on this slide reflects a different uh, as empirical study um, adjusting for confounders that higher levels of everyday discrimination is linked to uh, coronary artery calcification, to inflammation, to higher blood pressure, to lower birth weight among pregnant, for pre pregnant women, their infants, uh, to uh, cognitive impairment among the elderly, to poorer sleep, to premature mortality, to visceral fat, to shorter telomere length, to arterial sti stiffness, to incident cardiovascular events. You just see the range of outcomes that are impacted by the stress of discrimination. And research is also indicating that there are hidden ways in which stressors linked to race and racism adversely affect health. One study by Brandisha Tynes shows that for black and Latinx adolescents, 11 to 19 years old, um, greater exposure to online videos of someone from their racial or ethnic group beaten, arrested, or detained or shot by the police is associated with higher PTSD and depressive symptoms. A study uh, that I conducted with other colleagues uh, showed that every police killing of an unarmed black person leads to worse mental health, not just for the family and friends, but for the entire African American population in the state in which that shooting occurred for the next three months. And there was no effect in this study among whites. Other evidence indicates that over 70% of black women in this country are very concerned that their children might be harmed by the police. And what's the impact of that? A study published earlier this year of over 3,000 mothers in 20 cities found that almost one in four of their children had been stopped by the police by the age of 15. And mothers of youth who were stopped by the police were more than twice as likely than others to report both depression and anxiety-related sleep difficulties. What are the consequences of all of these stressors linked to segregation? On top of that, stressors linked uh, to exposure to discrimination. Scientists are using different words, accelerated aging, premature aging, biological weathering. What they are documenting is that in this country, populations of color are literally aging biologically more rapidly than whites. Why? Because if you live in a bad environment, your age is not only telling us how long you have lived, it's telling us how long you've been exposed to bad environmental conditions and how physiologically compromised you have become as a result of such exposure. And that leads to the earlier onset of chronic disease. Here's an example of the CDC of the racial differences in, in high, high blood pressure at age 50 to 64. You see 61% of African Americans have hypertension compared to 41% of whites, and this pattern exists for a broad range of conditions. So I've talked about segregation. I've talked about individual discrimination. There's also cultural racism deeply embedded in our culture, uh, the stereotypes, the stigma that leads to both implicit and explicit biases that have consequences for health and for access to health care. Uh, unequal treatment is a report published back in 2003 uh, from the National Academy of Medicine that documents pervasive racial bias in medical care. Let me just sh share with you a recent study um, uh, published last year, a study of 1.8 million hospital births in the state of Florida. It found that when cared for by white doctors, black babies are three times more likely than white newborns to die in the hospital. That disparity, though, is cut in half when black babies are cared for by a black doctor. So what can we do about all these inequities? Strategy number one, we need to build more health into the delivery of medical care. 
first thing we need to do is to ensure access to care for all. I'm not going to elaborate on that. That's obvious. It's something we should do. Secondly, we need to diversify the workforce to meet the needs of all patients. A randomized controlled trial of 1,300 black men in Northern California uh, who were given a coupon to go to a free uh, Saturday clinic. When they got to the clinic, they were randomized to see a black doctor or not. The study found that men who saw uh, a doctor of their same race were more likely to talk about health, other health problems, more likely to do screening for diabetes, more likely to do screening for the flu, uh, get a flu vaccine, sorry, and to do screening uh, for cholesterol. We face a challenge as a nation. In 2014, there were fewer African American men in the first year of medical school than in 1978. In the mid-1960s, 2.9% of all practicing physicians in the U.S. were black. In 2019, 5% of physicians are black, 6% are Latino, 3 tenths of 1% are Native American. What else do we need to do? We need to provide care that addresses the social context. The World Health Organization says, what do we accomplish if all we do is treat illness and send people back to live in the same conditions that made them sick in the first place. There's a recent report from the National Academy of Medicine that lays out the many opportunities for healthcare systems and healthcare professionals to address the social needs of their patients, and I recommend this report to you uh, for your reading. What else can we do? We need to create what I call communities of opportunity to minimize, neutralize, and dismantle the systems of racism that have created inequities in health and in access to opportunity in the first place. That means we need to enrich the quality of neighborhood environments. We need to increase economic development in poor areas. We need to improve housing quality and the safety of neighborhoods. Here are multiple strategies that can accomplish this. Investing in early childhood, reducing childhood poverty, enhancing income and employment opportunities for youth and adults, improving neighborhood and housing conditions, enhancing economic opportunities to build strong families and reduce uh, disparities in marriage. I have time today to only give you an example of two of them. Investing in early childhood, the first one, the Carolina Abyssidarian Project took poor kids, 80% of them African, randomized them at birth to get an early childhood program where they benefited from a nurturing environment, good nutrition, good pediatric care, good intellectual stimulation. By their mid-30s, birth through five, by their mid-30s, Lower levels of risk factor for cardiovascular disease and metabolic disease effects stronger for males. Here is an example, systolic blood pressure in the treatment group uh, in the mid-30s compared to the control group. A big difference of 143 um, versus 126 uh, as their systolic blood pressure uh, reading scores. Uh, the second example I want to give is improving neighborhood and housing conditions. The move into opportunity randomized public housing residents to move to less poor neighborhoods. No health intervention. All they did was change the neighborhood. 10 to 15 years later, those who moved had lower levels of obesity, lower levels of severe obesity, and lower diabetes risk. What is holding us back? What are the barriers that we have to address? I would say there are three big ones. We need to raise awareness levels of the challenges faced by disadvantaged racial and ethnic populations in this country. Most Americans, research has shown, has been unaware of the nature and extent of inequities in health and in access to economic opportunities in this country. And secondly, importantly, we need to build a science base that will guide us in how to best develop the political will to address the racial and social inequities in health. And finally, probably a key to building political will is we need to build empathy. That is, we need to identify how to tell the story of the challenges of disadvantaged populations in ways that resonate with the public so that the public feels their pain and has compassion and says this is unacceptable in our country and we will work together to build a healthier America for all. I leave you today with the words of Martin Luther King. He said it may well be that we will have to repent in this generation, not merely for the vitriolic words and the violent actions of the bad people, but for the appalling silence and the indifference of the good people. 
We can no longer be silent. We can no longer be indifferent. The time has come for us to work together to create good health in all aspects of health for all Americans. Thank you so very much for your time and attention uh, today.